Greetings, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Higher Ed Geek Podcast. This is episode number 26 with Brian Leduc, a good friend of mine, a fellow kind of higher ed hustler, as I'm starting to call it, uh, part of a, just a little meetup group that I've had. Um, uh, Ashley, a uh, recent episode, was another member, um, and uh, I'm sure we'll get to the other members, uh, Grant Troll and Kevin O'Connell soon, but always good talking with Brian. He always uh, kind of gets my energy flowing uh, with his enthusiasm and uh, just the really cool, unique path that he's had. He's really experienced a lot of the uh, sort of continually blossoming uh, higher ed adjacent world, um, so he'll talk more about that and uh, all the cool stuff that he has cooking up right now. So as always, all the cool stuff that we talk about is in the show notes um, and uh, strap in for a super awesome episode here after this brief message from our sponsor. This is episode number 26 with Brian LeDuck. It's an honor to have our good friends at Swiftcake be a sponsor of the podcast because I've seen their work firsthand and it's truly unlike any student leadership training I've experienced. They've been voted best student leadership program unprecedented five times, so you know they must be doing something right. As a bonus for our listeners, Swiftkick is giving a $500 discount off their normal speaking fee if you mention Higher Ed Geek when you contact them. I highly recommend their trainings for your campus as your students will be talking about it for months afterwards. It's really great stuff. Check them out at swiftkickhq.com to learn more and let them know I sent you. Now, back to the show. But, uh, yeah, I'm excited for this just because, uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, I've noted this, I think, to you before, just like I always get very, like, energized by our conversations. And I know you always have a lot of kind of Same. different things cooking or different ideas and just like, you know, a lot of thoughts. So um, yeah, it'll be interesting to just like kind of hear and especially just sort of like, I don't know, people have taken it very many different ways, but just sort of like what you geek out about. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's always kind of funny that way. But. But uh, yeah, I mean, we'll we'll jump in here, and I'll, I'll link out to um, the episode that we did prior, just for you know folks who might be interested uh, for the Student Affairs Collective podcast. But um, yeah, we'll we'll get into all the other stuff. Uh, but real quick, if you want to give a quick introduction of yourself uh, to get us started, and just kind of how you got to be where you are today, and then we'll kind of pick and you know choose some different stuff from uh, kind of your story to dig in a little bit deeper with. Very cool. Yeah. So I'm Brian Leduc. I uh, I am uh, currently at the Education Design Lab, where I'm an education designer, um, and that probably is not uh, particularly clear to, to folks who are listening. So, in effect, uh, I design uh, design sessions where I'm sharing uh, tools related to human-centered design, lean startup, and other innovation methodologies that uh, are really helping universities to uh, consider the way that they're delivering services on their campus and the way that they're interacting with their students and ensuring that what they're building is actually grounded in the student's point of view. Uh, and the particular sort of area that the lab has focused its work and really the, the tagline that I've been living in for about the last year and a half is designing education toward the future of work. Uh, we're seeing an incredible number of trends that are driving the way that universities are now starting to think about how they adapt uh, and we're, we're a part of you know, how, they're, how they're thinking about uh, their strategy uh, in, in that area and, and what they're building towards. But you know, where I started uh, was as a uh, psych student at Roger Williams University uh, growing, after growing up in a small town in central Massachusetts. So I never would have expected myself to be in D.C. and never would have expected myself as a first-gen student to have gotten as involved on campus as I did. And that's really, the, that was the rocket fuel into uh, higher ed and into education. It was like sitting across from Chuck Stanley, uh, at, you know, as a, uh, as freshman class president, talking to him about the, you know, the next event that we were planning and him saying, did you know, like, this is a career, you know, like the, the, the story that every student affairs professional has at some point in their career about having that, uh, that interaction with, right, you know, a really formative uh, mentor in their, in their, career path. And it was from that that I uh, was was working uh, and going to school at Texas A&M, um, passed through a couple of different student activities or student involvement or student engagement offices alongside some orientation work and some leadership development work. Um, and since then, you know, I've been sort of what maybe we would all call higher ed adjacent and, uh, you know, continuing into my, into my current role. So I was at Education Advisory Board for a while, uh, helping to 
uh, implement an academic advising student success technology on campuses. So I was working with, you know, provosts and presidents who were, you know, thinking about how they were improving their retention and graduation rates. And they, you know, had had purchased uh, the student success collaborative tool and they needed basically strategic help about how to implement it. Uh, but they also, we'd also collected 10 years of historic data. Um, and so I was looking at, you know, just unbelievable amounts of, uh, of historic retention and graduation rate data, and then using that to basically build out what the, what the strategy was going to be, what the approach for, may, in many cases, translating an academic advising approach that was maybe more reactive mm-hmm. to one that was going to be more strategic and data-driven, and equipping academic advisors with both a tool and some guidance, you know, through that through that data analysis about where they might focus their time and attention. And it was about uh, two and a half years in that I started talking with folks at the Iron Yard, which was a, a small coding bootcamp. And actually, that's um, <laughs> I think when we probably last did uh, our podcast together. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and so I I joined uh, the DC campus as their campus director. So I was you know effectively. Uh, running all things student experience. So everywhere from, you know, the marketing in D.C. through the enrollment process, uh, student support one-on-one while students were in the program, and then building relationships with employers externally, uh, you know, to, to get students placed once they'd completed the, the 12-week boot camp uh, and learning how to, how to code. So, you know, the, the last probably four or four and a half years really has been adjacent to higher ed, but in many ways, sort of, uh, right now I'm working at the the confluence of all of those past uh, areas of my work. You know, it's sort of like a little bit of student success, a little bit of student experience design, a little bit of uh, small tests done over time, uh, and and a lot of thinking about how we design both systems and experiences that help students to be more successful. So that's maybe a long-winded answer, but. <laughs> That's that's where I that's where I came from. No, yeah, I mean you you covered it, and yeah, you've kind of had that journey of uh, sort of going where the wind takes you, and yeah, I mean I, I certainly share that uh, that feeling sometimes of I'm like, man, if I could th- like go back and talk to like high school me, like I, you know, I don't know where I thought I was going to end up, but it certainly wasn't here. But you know, I'm kind of grateful for the uh, for the journey there. But um, uh, I I started at Roger Williams as a marketing major. I uh, thought I was going to be uh, going right into uh, right into an enterprise, you know, like either consulting or I was like thinking I was going to be in in ads or, you know, like it just it's so funny now to think about um, that conception of my mind was entirely the result of just such a limited frame of reference. You know, I just like was thinking that, oh, OK, so like I want to go work in business and if I'm going to be in marketing, that means I'm going to be creating ads. And now, like, entire industries have exploded since that point. And, like, yeah, I mean, I do some digital marketing stuff, but that's that doesn't have to be – that's not my job. You know, like, it's not where my – the depth of my knowledge and, and expertise has been built. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I think that's many people's experience because I know some people – yeah, the, the, that shared story of how people happen upon higher ed and student affairs. And um, totally. I know for my current role um, at to you, like we have a lot of people that end up here that, you know, worked in some other education capacity, just didn't feel like it was the right fit. And then, you know, ended up here. And I know some, sometimes that's the, there's actually a lot of people in my cohort for my higher ed grad program that uh, thought they wanted to uh, kind of K through 12 classroom instruction, didn't mm-hmm. feel like the right fit ended up in higher ed. And it's just that idea of like, they want to work in education, but they want something different. They want to help people um, and, you know, all that sort of thing. So it's, uh, yeah, it's always something that people sort of happen upon, um, but I think always for good reasons and it resonates with them. And it's certainly now, even just for the frame of reference of like, you know, in my grad program, people being like, well, what do you want to do? It's like, my frame of reference for the entire sort of higher ed adjacent world and things that people do outside of campus based work didn't even exist. And I think now it's like people ask, he's like, would you ever go back? And I'm like, maybe, but I'd be like so picky. (laughs) I would be very, you know, uh, particular, I guess, about how I would go back. But, um, and not to mention how much, you know, higher education in general is going to be disrupted. It's sort of like, where, where do you want to now plug back in and how, and what should that look? I mean, to you is a great example of it. We've talked about this before, but you know the 
the set of acquisitions and the use of uh, the, the way that WeWork is approaching itself as a platform um, and sort of like acquiring Meetup and partnering with 2U and acquiring Flatiron. Like there are existing uh, entities that are looking at groups like WeWork and the way that they're becoming community platforms and the networked campus and the sort of remote worker who is doing student development work but not working on a college campus is like an emerging reality. And so like, even graduate preparation is, is uh, still sort of looking at the, a traditional route into, uh, you know, a, a traditional uh, on-campus grounded experience when there are a lot of ways to use that skill set and still be working with students who are going to post-secondary, mm-hmm. which is even, you know, which blows my mind consistently because it, like, like you said, it emerged literally since the time that we both graduated from our, from our master's degrees. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a brave new world. Uh, but uh, I guess, yeah, it's sort of like you mentioned sort of like, you know, this kind of point of like a limited frame of reference, like that's sort of where you were at in your undergraduate career. Um, you mentioned like some involvements in there. So I guess before we move on and explore a little bit more of like your current world and the different things that you do, um, is there any kind of like little anecdote or story or anything else, uh, you know, in particular that you might want to mention um, from your undergraduate college days that was just like a formative experience for you just personally and or professionally? When I was a senior in high school, but I, I'm going to go all the way back, like pre-college, because I think the transition from high school to college, and I was just, um, so I, I'm also a, a facilitator for Kiwanis, uh, where I run high school leadership retreats, and I was just with a group of 70 high school students in Pennsylvania, so the like, story is fresh on my mind, uh, because I was telling it to them, because it's it's sort of uh, the group that ends up being at Key Leader events is probably the group that I would have been part of had I known about Key Leader during that time in my in my high school career, mm-hmm. but I wasn't there because there was a whole bunch of other stuff that was happening in my life. I like could, you know, wasn't finding my way, wasn't super connected with school, wasn't very involved, uh, was, was generally pretty, uh, what's, what's the right word for it? I was generally like pretty disconnected, uh, and pretty angsty as, <laughs> as a, as a high school kid. Um, uh, but when I started to look at colleges, I got on campus at Roger Williams and walked around and was like, Oh, this is where I want to be. And, uh, and when I was getting ready to go back on campus for orientation, I had decided before I left that I was going to run for freshman class president. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) and like my mom who, you know, has always been super supportive, but like I said, I'm a first generation college student. And so like, she had no idea. She like, didn't know how to prep me for the college experience in general, despite the fact that, um, my sister's eight years older. And so like she, gave me some way finding from a distance, but you know, it's like second, it's sort of second hand. Um, and you know, accounting for, uh, the fact that, you know, that there wasn't the same level of uh, guidance from my, from my mom in the, in the process. But she's like, looking at me like, you're going to be what? <laughs> so I go, so I go to orientation and I find, uh, uh, who's going to be my vice president, like who's going to be my running mate, uh, in my orientation group and, you know, get back and I'm like talking to, to uh, family friends uh, about the fact that I'm going to run for freshman class president when I get on campus, my mom is like, "Who is this kid?" So the uh, the day before I'm supposed to move in, uh, I get a call from one of my roommates, which by the way was in a quad in, in like the freshman residence hall on campus. And he's like, "Hey man, like you know there are only a couple of us on campus because they were trying to let people who were from further away uh, come to campus first. He's like, "Hey man." Uh, you know, I'm all, all set up in the room, like we're ready. Uh, you, if you want to come out, you can. <laughs> and so I look at my mom. We moved in the night before move in at like eight or nine o'clock. You know, like I look back and like the hall director, the uh, the RA on my floor, they must have just been like completely blindsided by like this car with a, a small trailer because my mom owned a small business and she had uh, a trailer that she would use to, to take inventory to to different stores mm-hmm. <laughs> like pulls up to the front of uh, cedar hall at roger williams we're like we're moving in they're like what are you doing here uh so th- that was probably emblematic of the level of enthusiasm that i had going to roger williams but i had no idea like why or like what it was about 
and the the involvement as freshman class president just per, you know was the rocket fuel for uh, everything that came after in terms of involvement in higher ed. Because I looked around, I was just like, I love this designing of experiences for other people. Like this is awesome, and I had no idea, I hadn't put it into those words yet, um, but that's what was behind it. Very cool. Um, <laughs> that's a. Uh... Yeah, I think uh, you know, working in res life, it's like we always have those people who are just like, "I'm here," and I'm like, "All right, get get in here, you knucklehead," because it's like I'm not gonna turn you away. Like you're here, it's fine. Um, so yeah, it's funny. It's just like you're one of those people, but yeah, yeah just it's like yeah, very eager. You're excited, you know. Just uh, um, but uh, yeah, and like you, like you're saying, you didn't like really articulate it in the exact words that you would now, but you know always somebody who I think thought in the way of kind of uh, designing experiences to kind of achieve, you know, positive outcomes. Um, So, you know, that's kind of what you're doing now. I guess just speak a little bit more about that in terms of like, you know, what attracted you to this job, you you know, you've been in it for a little while and just like what you enjoy most about your current work. Yeah. The, uh, so we work on a whole range of different types of projects. So it's, we're, we're a, a national nonprofit. So we end up getting, you know, a range of, individual schools who are trying to approach a very particular problem you know, have articulated or may may not have yet articulated what it is that they're trying to accomplish but they just know that like they've identified a pain point and they need to learn a little bit more about it before they figure out how they're going to adjust uh, and in other cases we're working with you know a large foundation who's got a group of schools that are all uh, you know, looking to learn from one another while they're attempting to solve a unified problem that they've identified across all the different, all those different institutions. So uh, much of my work sort of focuses in the, in the former of that, where we'll get, a, you know, a, like a two day or three day uh, engagement where we're, we're usually both asked to teach a little bit of design thinking, human centered design, and some of the tools and methodologies that are associated with it. And then as an extension of that, you know, sort of use those teaching moments as uh, propulsion to, you know, ed- do some work against the, the challenge that they've identified. Uh, for more sustained projects, like there's, there's one that I'm working on now uh, with a, a campus who's looking at building out a branch campus in the Southwest, uh, that it's been, you know, like a year's worth of, of work in a few different, uh, in a few different um, uh, aspects. And, you know, part of that was like a market analysis and part of it was going and meeting with all these different community stakeholders and learning more about like what the community needs were, you know, part of it was about uh, engaging with local employers and high school students and learning what their needs were and then like building something out of that and showing it back to them and then them circulating it with their set of, of stakeholders. And now we're actually going through the process of like building that thing. So it's uh it's super interesting in terms of like the range and the different number of conceptions of the, the work that we're doing. Um, and you know, re, as you sort of noted, it, it very much is about uh, building experiences for people and kind of creating moments for people to discover something new. Uh, and then I think probably one of the most helpful uh, components of utilizing an approach like design thinking, uh, I mean, there are, there are a few different, methodology, you know, tons of different methodologies to be able to like use as a way of visualizing collectively against a goal that you're, you know, a problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and in many cases, people talk around what it is that they're meaning and there isn't a whole lot of structure or clarity or agreement about what they're trying to develop. So what we're, what we're kind of building into is here are some common frameworks and a common language and a way of like looking at something in the collective format visually, and sometimes that's like sticky notes, other times it's pictures, other times it's you know something active in the room. Um, and once people start to like see what it is, and I literally you know, like visually, it's like visualized in front of them. Now you're having a more productive debate, and it's about content. It's not about like who's in the room. You know, it's like slightly more democratized than you would typically find if you were having a conversation about how to structure a program, for instance. Um, and so like, that's, that's what I love about it because people get out, of, get out of their heads and onto paper, and that's where you actually start to uh, see the substance of an idea and then 
you can more effectively manipulate and evaluate it uh, in ways that you can't when it's, you know, either in prose or in just conversation. Yeah, very cool stuff. And uh, yeah, I guess I'm very intrigued by the uh, almost doing it on a very macro scale of like uh, doing it like a branch campus and almost like using it from the get go, building something from the ground up, a kind of brick and mortar experience, you know, versus like, you know, I'm sure many campuses, they just need to work with the space that they already have, or the, you know, that has to kind of fill in sort of cracks that exist versus, you know, uh, utilizing a kind of a design thinking mindset to build something from the ground up. So that's really yeah, cool. And that, uh, when, you, when you're building something like when nothing exists, I mean, if, if you were to now start a university, it would look vastly different than what we have planted all over the country. And so like, there's freedom that comes like there's permission that comes with that and that's really a fun aspect of it you know that you're we're not designing like the university that you see all over the country today you're designing something that is uh built for the emerging needs uh so that it will meet them when you know as as they're as they're um becoming evident yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, well, I guess, you know, if it's sort of stuff in this vein or just other kind of just personal, uh, interest or whatever, I'm very curious to hear, um, you know, sort of the things that you geek out about currently, if it's, you know, newer discoveries or stuff that you've always been into. And yeah, I guess if you take it from either angle, if it's more kind of a professional or sort of academic interests or just kind of fun stuff that you um, get really uh, excited about, but yeah, kind of what, what do you get yeah. about? Uh, so I've, I've been really captured by uh, just like future of work uh, as, as a, as a category of just stuff, you know, like we, we're, we're probably in one of the most uh, interesting times of human evolution in quite some time. And to be sort of like on the pre crest of the wave, but like able to see the crest forming is pretty insane. Like, you know, to yeah. have grown up like barely using dial up internet and like aim like instant messenger. <laughs> and now to be, uh, going into my apartment and saying like Alexa play whatever. Um, and that being like the early end of the curve is crazy to me. Um, and I think it has unbelievable implications for the way that we're all going to experience work and life and, uh, what it will mean for identity. And so all, the, all that is at the core of, of in, in effect what I'm geeking out over. Cause it has, I mean, it has impl huge implications for higher ed has huge implications for what we teach and how we teach and where we teach. And, um, and so, yeah, I, <laughs> you, you'll probably uh, notice it. Like, I think work life balance is sort of bullshit. I think we're balls of energy and I, you know, I, I don't necessarily care what I'm doing as a, as I'm enjoying it. Uh, so I find myself like, spending a lot of time um, listening to podcasts and learning new things and creating meetup groups and uh, doing stuff that is like not my job, but is equally as energizing. And, um, and so like as a facet of that, uh, the sort of research around future of work has implications for what I do every day, but it's like stuff that I like to go home and do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just kind of like creative you know, hobbies that may produce things or, or not, or yeah, just like you're yeah, absorbing information and learning yourself, which then sort of, uh, in, in kind of impacts your work or yeah, kind of like nurturing these other kind of networks and groups and hobbies and things like that. Cause yeah, for me, it's like, I, I write, I do this podcast and yeah, I want to go out to an event and talk to people about things and just, you know, kind of generate ideas and get inspired. But, um, yeah. And I mean, I think some, it came up before when you were kind of talking a lot about like, um, you know, uh, sort of your, your journey and sort of like, okay, I'm going to school, you know, I have to pick a major and that you're sort of doing that with some sort of nebulous career in mind. And then a lot of the work that you're doing is yeah, kind of uh, building education for the future of work. And I, I think I, maybe I'm not surrounding myself with a lot of people who are, uh, like there's a lot of people who are very vocal about that sort of like, okay, we need to, uh, uh, improve higher education to help support the future of work. And I'm sure there's other people who are kind of 
either against that kind of notion sure. or hesitant about it or just quiet about it because it makes people kind of uncomfortable. But I know, um, yeah, it, the way that you kind of framed it is like, yeah, it, part of it is, yes, we need to make sure we, we have those things that bring us joy integrated into our lives. But work, you know, we, it's not about making college into just factories that pump out, you know, whatever right. corporations want or something, you know, but it's like work is the way that we contribute to the world. And I think we want people to be able to find, you know, those intersections of what they're good at and what they're into, but also just make sure that, you know, that we build a smarter world, that we build a better world and that we equip people to be able to do that. You know, cause I think a lot about just like renewable energy and just like, you know, like, you know, stuff like, tesla power packs like existing it's like yeah. we need smart people who are like really into that stuff to be enabled to create things that harness solar energy and store it for later because we've had solar panels for a, a while and part of the reason why they don't catch on is because it's like well what happens when it's not sunny and it's like only now are we being like yeah we, we figured that out we've got a solution now we've got like you know power packs to store you know solar energy or wind energy whatever um so it's like it, yeah, you want to enable people because it's also like there's so many amazing stories yet to be told. So even if it's somebody going to school to nurture their, you know, kind of creative uh, energy to get a full time career, it's like, you know, especially in America, entertainment has been dominated by, you know, white men for a long time. So it's like, let's nurture people to be able totally. to cultivate that, to share new stories and to bring more insights and sort of, you know, emotional awakenings and awareness and all the different stuff. So it's just like, yeah, I, I've kind of clicked that into place. And it's like, there's a lot there if you really get down into the details, but certainly one of the biggest needs, like you were mentioning is just like, yeah, with, you know, smart homes and right. AI and, you know, virtual reality and all that kind of stuff. It's like, there's a lot of tech that is baked into building education for the future of work, but there's a lot it's, more there. And I think, you know, that's a, a discussion that I hope it's people so would, funny, you know, the, the idea that, uh, what we're, what we're now doing by adapting higher ed to meet workforce needs and that in some way being against sort of the core underlying foundation for why universities were created is like fascinating to me because at the, at its absolute foundation, if we're talking about creating citizens, who are able to live lives of purpose and meaning. Like if you, if you like wrap up like liberal arts education as creating, you know, citizens with the purpose of, uh, who, who understand their purpose and meaning uh, over time and, and are able to learn how to learn and continually integrate new information and adapt. Uh, like we're, we're actually at the like ultimate inflection point of being able to do that effectively. And so the adaptation, if you're really paying attention to what is happening in the future of work, is that like they don't need a cog. They don't need someone who's just gonna, like, gonna plug in, in somewhere. Like routine non-cognitive work will go away. So the idea that we would just be like adapting someone to a workforce need is fascinating to me because the workforce need is human. You know, like <laughs> what, what, we, what we need are like, creative systems thinkers who are able to uh, adapt over time and think critically and who work well with others. And like that, that's what a, what, that's what a university needs to get like unbelievably good at doing. And oh yeah, share some technical knowledge. Um, you know, the, the emergence and part of my reason for going over to the iron yard was just like curiosity about how does this thing work? And the reality is that like the vast majority of students that were going to a program that's based on what what programs like the Iron Yard are about is they're looking for a career change signal. Like they need to learn a new skill and uh, that is enough to get them in the door. But like they still need those core human skills. Like the ones that were getting hired and finding you know, like had multiple offers and were doing really well uh, as they were making the transition were the ones that like had the human thing locked. And it's partially because they had worked before and partially because, particularly in DC, they were some of like the most educated people. You know, like they had uh, bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and some like JDs and PhDs. So it was like the, the, the lifelong learning element of what it is that we're, what we need to embed within universities and the types of skills that we're trying to cultivate are so much more human and those are actually the workforce demanded skills. 
So like the idea of a dichotomy between the two, sorry, I'm like going on a rant here, but the idea that there's like a dichotomy between the two <laughs> is like a, a complete misnomer. You know, it's like we're, we're, no one's listening long enough to hear what is, what is actually being said. Um, so th- I guess that's another, another geek out. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we just, yeah, we just like had a geek out kind of showcased right here. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, it's exactly what it is. And I know, um, cause I'll, I'll just, I think the next question here is just to sort of sort of like this particular things that you are kind of like yeah. consuming right now. But I know one for me that I just mentioned to somebody that gets into a lot of this stuff, uh, which I'm not sure if you have, uh, checked it out yet but they've now kind of gotten into the rhythm with new episodes is uh future you um which is uh jeff salingo and michael horn um they it's kind of a combination of them talking about stuff which you know they're totally people kind of in this space um and then they always have a, a guest but I, I like how their format is a either preceding or after uh the interview they just sort of talk through um kind of the issue at hand but yeah it's getting into that stuff because i think yeah part of that sort of weird kind of limbo that we're in now is that like a lot of people are looking to Mm -hmm. the past to determine the future um of just like yeah like college and it being for a select few so it has to be built you know or it was built in a certain way for a select few and it is more leaning towards just sort of like personal fulfillment and just liberal arts sort of like generalist just to build you as a full human being which can always still be part of it and that is valuable and that experience i think will always exist and people can seek it out if they want to but building sort of quality education at scale that's flexible and sort of lifelong, you know, to uh, meet those needs for different things and, you know, things that we don't even know exist yet. Um, you know, that's that, what the more recent episode they just had was sort of like saying that we're in this like fifth mm-hmm. age of higher ed, um, which yeah. check out the episode so you can learn what all the ages are. It makes a lot of sense. It was really cool. Um, but uh, yeah, this like historical phasing and we're just entering into this very new phase, but we've, you know, uh, higher ed has existed and evolved and grown through all these phases. And, you know, we're just in the thick of a very disruptive one now where, um, you know, some schools have been closing or, you know, getting rid of certain majors or programs, but, you know, it's sort of that idea of you, you know, cl- you know, clear out space to make room for other things. Uh, yeah. so, um, yeah. And I think it's just this, the duplicity across like, you know, there's just been this one model that everybody replicates, uh, for the most part, in terms of like higher ed, but it's like, you know, I think there's just a need for, for more different kinds of, uh, yeah, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling through episodes right now. I'm seeing like, you know, Joseph own, you know, president of Northeastern, uh, you know, Kathy Davidson, uh, Michael Crow, just, yeah, like a, a killer, killer cast of super sharp, uh, folks who are, who are, you know, part of this conversation. Um, so much, so much stuff to be, to be unpacked here. I mean, the, what, what's fascinating, I think, you know, what's worth spending a, a minute on is uh, who we think we're serving has has changed and will continue to change in such drastic ways, particularly, you know, if you look at even just like enrollment trends in the Northeast. I mean, I think the evolution of what will become uh, the coming of age experience, you know, sort of like as the way I categorize it in my mind, like four year on campus residential continuous uh, relationship with higher ed. Yeah, I think like it, it's, it's going to shift. And so how, how do you prepare, uh, mindsets of both like students of parents as they're like shopping with their students and, uh, you know, and administrators on campus who, you know, like have, have a set of underlying principles that have ruled the reality of the day about the way that their world works. And when so many of those things get shaken up. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's going to be a really interesting decade, <laughs> I think for higher ed. Um, so the, you know, uh-huh. like the underlying goal of, of where, you know, part of my reason for even spending time in, you know, <laughs> automation of all things, or like the future of retail of all things is, uh, because I think there, there are small signals for how we now take lessons and learn and adapt and apply them within the context that we're working in higher ed. Yeah. Um, Cause yeah, like higher ed, as much as it kind of is a bubble, uh, you know, is still part of the world and uh, the world affects higher ed as much as it affects uh, the world. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think yeah, the next decade I'm sure just will be uh, uh, very interesting to see. 
Um, well, and I guess, you know, as you're kind of geeking out about a lot of these kind of topics and things or, you know, just anything else that kind of is bringing you joy recently, like what are you um, consuming? Like what are you reading, watching, listening to, anything that you'd like to mention so that we could... Uh, yeah, uh, I, I was actually just listening to the uh, Katrina Lake how I built this. Uh, I'm talking about her test of, of stitch mm-hmm. fix. Uh, one, I just like love Guy Raz and the types of questions that he he uh, asks of people, and more importantly, like the way that he pushes people on answering in in areas that he senses are like maybe taboo about what they want to talk about versus what they're there to talk about. And uh, so I just like love how he like will hone in on something and just like go deep on it. Uh, but uh, maybe even so like more meta across basically every show you know, like the, the stitch fix episode uh jumps out at me uh, the airbnb the joe gebbia episode for airbnb jumps out at me um and what i think is so interesting and so fun about that show is that it's it's permission you know it basically is like these these folks who uh identified something in their life that was bugging the hell out of them and they decided like, what's the smallest thing that I can do today to learn something about whether or not the thing that I see in the world is irritating to other people? And like, could that be a business that I build my life around? Um, you know, like Katrina Lake uh, knew that she wanted to start some kind of a business or she actually had worked uh, as like basically a note taker for a, for a VC firm, I think. And, you know, she... Uh, was seeing all these companies come through and her aspiration I think was to eventually like find one that she wanted to join and like pitch them as they were pitching her you know pitching her company to like go join them and like leave leave this like note-taking role that she was in to go uh, jump on a rocket ship but uh, what ended up happening is she decided to go back to business school and like ended up at at in a Harvard MBA program and was testing a couple of different ideas, but stumbled upon this idea of like stitch fix and thinking about the future of retail and how stores were closing and going, I think that like we're going to need a different solution here at some point. And so she found basically strangers in Boston and handed out a, a, a short survey to, for them to give her information about what their shopping preferences and style was. And she got a six a credit card with a six thousand dollar limit, shopped for them, and then gave them all the stuff and was able to like manage the receipts on the back end. Like that with twenty people in Boston was her test before she like started to go get funding. So what I love about that show is just that it's about like what can I do at with you know at the lowest possible barrier to entry to find out if what I think is true about the world is true. And if that's the case, then how do I now find what the next question is and the next question is? That's just like a series of small experiments. Um, and uh, Joe Gebbia's story about Airbnb, I won't go into it, but it's like he basically saw a conference coming to San Francisco and literally blew up an air mattress and made a website. And like that was V.01 of, of uh, Airbnb. So I just love that show because it, it's permission. It's like, what can you go learn? Um, there was a time that right after I left the iron yard, I was, um, wondering if there was a market for, um, it basically like admissions advising or admissions coaching for different boot camps. <laughs> so like, you know, bought up, uh, uh, you know, a URL made a Twitter account, started following people who were talking about, you know, whether or not they wanted to go to a boot camp, uh, bought like $10 worth of Facebook ads. Uh, and put them out there into the world and just like saw what happened. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's that stuff that's just so, so much fun. It gives permission and it's like, you you have so, so many fewer barriers than you believe that you have to quote unquote starting, starting a business or starting a new program or starting something new. You just need a little bit of ingenuity and a little bit of permission and a little bit of structure. Uh, and with the right discipline to identify what are the things that you need to know right now versus what are the things that you can learn along the way. Um, I, I, so I just love that show. <laughs> yeah. Well, and because I assume not every one of my guests, uh, especially with how they post and stuff, have uh, listened to all my episodes. But just so you know, you have continued the trend. So if nobody who listens to this, <laughs> you're like people who have listened to this haven't checked out how I built this. <laughs> 
it's been i think half of the episodes if not more <laughs> people independent of each other because it's not even people being like oh i listened to your other episode and like they mentioned this and i want to recommend it too it's just like which is even better like objectively people recommend the yeah. show because it's really good and i mean it's one of those ones too where like like you're mentioning you know you could listen through all of them they're all great stories and yeah there's like these very humble beginnings of these now like sometimes global companies or those like even if they've still just been like oh we carved out this niche for ourselves right. and we're just continuing to sort of like try to you know just kind of do our thing but um yeah it's everything from like ben and jerry's right. to um yeah like stitch fix airbnb linkedin netflix yeah. like you know all these different kind of cool companies like newer ones and, and older ones so um yeah, and it's just like the yeah these wild stories. The one you know the companies they have that didn't work out, or like you know uh, just these kind of long meandering sort of journeys that people have been on. And it's uh yeah, it's a big idea. It gives you permission, or just right. sort of just is like yeah, like especially yeah, if you're doing like something where because um, I think that's you know these people have very different stories, and some that you know they are the very humble beginnings where. Um, yeah, it's not as if it's like, oh, I need to come up with an idea that's like an overnight success that's going to scale from zero to two million right. in like a year. I have to get like venture capital funding, and I need to do all this stuff. It's like, just start something small if you're interested, and like you're saying, like see if you get traction, and just try to like figure out what sort of like level of risk feels right because that's sort of like what I think the zeitgeist has become obsessed with. It's just like, um, like, you know, an entrepreneur, like doing a startup, it's like, well, you could just try and like rebrand of like, I'm starting a small business. Like that has a completely different connotation in people's <laughs> minds, but it's that idea where it's like, no, you're like getting a reasonable amount of money. Yeah. Like you're maybe using your credit card that has a high limit just to like get some, ca you know, get some stuff to like, you know, the tools that you need to get going and like, but you really need to be mindful of risks and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. But it seems like, yeah, just a lot of people want to just like start a startup and like, you know, drop everything and ignore risk and just want it to be an overnight success. And if it's not, then you're a failure or whatever. Like, yeah. it's like that, that maybe works out for some people, but that's not the only path. And, you know, again, the world is going to need people with kind of clever, bright new ideas of how to do things better. And um, I think, yeah, a lot of times there's, uh, you know, room for everybody at the table and maybe just defining what success looks like to you too. It doesn't again need to be like, you know, that you're now like a billion dollar company right. or something in like a year. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, interesting stuff like that. So again, yeah, go check out how I built this. <laughs> I feel the need to add like a layer of originality in there. Um, so <clears throat> there I've got like a handful of others that are always on my, on my short list. Um, and also, you know, like I got to make you work a little bit because on the show notes, if you just like say how I built this again, here are the same four episodes, you know, copy paste. That's, you know, it's like not super inspired. So, uh, Fair I enough. love the story behind the story. So Song Exploder is freaking awesome. They literally pick apart track by track um, different songs, and they've got the artist there talking about like the inspiration for it and what like what that sound was that you heard in the middle of the song that didn't make any sense, but was like somebody dropping a drumstick or whatever. Um, Ninety nine percent invisible, which effectively is just like design related, but the story that led to why a certain thing was built in the way that it was. Um, I, I'm a, I'm a Christian. So the, the Bible project is another great one, uh, that like <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the two guys that run, uh, that, that podcast, uh, like are the biggest Bible nerds that you've ever met in your entire, like ever, uh, <laughs> like the level of depth of, of knowledge that they have and of detail that they go into is like insane. Um, Tim Mackey, though, is a brilliant storyteller, so I love listening. There, it's like they do these podcasts as a way of brainstorming for a set of short videos that they create, which is their primary function of their nonprofit. So, like, super interesting if uh, if if that's uh, at all uh, something of of curiosity. And then uh, I li I listen to a lot of Ed Surge on air. Although what I'm discovering is that I should be also listening to Future You. I have a like 15 minute walk commute to work uh, back and forth so I don't get through a ton of episodes, generally speaking, I'll admit. Uh, but those are all on my uh, on my short list. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Ed Surge is, uh, is great. And um, yeah, it's just cool. I mean, just part of why I love podcasts. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, the Bible Project or something like that. Just like these, all these different affinities. Right. It's like any, anybody who's maybe just like dipping their feet right. in. Um, yeah, there's so much good stuff out there. Um, and uh, 
uh, yeah, I think what it reassures me too, though, like what I'll say, what I is like refreshing about um, future you is I think there are these two people that I think are very notable um, in their right. fields, but this show still feels very like kind of you know scrappy, kind of, like they're yeah, like they're making it into their garage kind of thing, you know. So it's because it's like sometimes like you'll hear like sirens going by still, and it's just like that happens to me. Um, so it's just like you know because you imagine it's like oh we're starting this podcast, it's going to be like in a professional studio yeah. and all that, right. but it's like you know they're they're taking it on the road too. So sometimes it's like weird, you know, people's phones go off in the middle of it. Ambulance um, sirens so are just, the great unifier of the podcast world, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's very hard to avoid them unless yeah you're in like a soundproof box somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll link out to all those shows and uh, yeah, a lot of you know different stuff that you've mentioned. Um, but yeah, we will wrap up this episode uh, just you know as we do on an optimistic note. Uh, something or things that you are looking forward to in your job, life, and or the world. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> so uh, over the last uh, I don't know probably just shy of a year, uh, I've been working with a, uh, with a, a partner of mine in Austin, uh, Spencer Ingram, who I th- think may be on your, on your roadmap at some point, um, to build uh, Best Monday Ever. And uh, we're helping sm- smart companies make career development a competitive advantage. And uh, so we focused on enterprise and in higher ed. And so over the course of this summer, we're holding a series of Basically, the I don't even want to use the word that gets associated with professional training in higher ed, uh, but basically to just say very highly interactive events, experiences uh, that are teaching a, a career discovery and exploration methodology that we call the looping method. So it's four four steps. So I've been geeking out talking with career career professionals, academic advisors, student success professionals. Uh, and uh, just getting a ton of energy around like the challenges that are being faced on campus and the need for uh, ways to approach work with a new mindset and the way that we work with students with a new mindset. Because I think when we invest in professionals that are working on the front lines with students every day, uh, we're actually investing in student retention. So you're going to like wind me up for another rant, but um Best Monday ever looping method dojos uh, are those are those two day events. So that's currently what my world is on fire for uh, and what I'm really excited about. So the first one is in a couple of weeks in D.C., followed by dates in Austin, Nashville, Richmond and Duluth, Minnesota. So be on the lookout. Mm. Cool. Um, yeah, I have to uh, I'll try to get this episode out before then just so uh Still might have some time to uh, check out that DC one. Um, but yeah, we'll at least uh, link out to everything and uh, folks can check it out. But yeah, I know you always have some cool stuff uh, kind of cooking up over there. So I wish you luck uh, with the, the looping method stuff. And um, yeah, folks can connect with you as well uh, to follow up after the episode. But um, yeah, just really appreciate your time and all the stuff that you shared. And again, yeah, it's always uh, energizing because I think we both just uh, yeah get really kind of geeked out about this stuff and always have a lot of ideas and are just, uh, yeah, I don't know, just like a, a sponge for kind of all this good stuff and just want to kind of make it happen and start, you know, getting to work. So, um, yeah, just appreciate your time and all that you shared. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll talk to you again awesome. soon. Awesome. Dustin, thanks. Such a cool conversation. This podcast is a proud member of the Connect EDU podcast network, bringing together diverse voices and thoughtful discussions to the higher ed community. Check us out online at connectedu.network or on Twitter at connectedupod. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. Please rate, review, and subscribe so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Geek podcast.